looking for the crank to crank up this podium a little bit. <laughs> Back in Pittsburgh, we have a special add-on podium that they put up there for me so they get the right distance for my eyes. Some of you understand that. Three pairs of glasses these days. <laughs> have you ever experienced what psychologists call separation anxiety? Uh, some people have, some people haven't. But uh, it's not all that uncommon. I remember when I was asked to babysit uh, a young fella in the neighborhood where I grew up. Uh, oh, I guess he was three, maybe four. And um, parents never went out very much. But uh, I said, sure, I could use the money for summer camp. So uh, I went over and took the job and I babysat this little young fella. And the minute mom and dad left that house, he started screaming at the top of his lungs, and that lasted for about an hour. They kind of warned me. She, they said, he'll settle down after a while. But this kiddo had some pretty severe separation anxiety. And then I was in the Boy Scouts, eventually got on the camp staff, became the program director of that camp up in Champion, Pennsylvania. And we had about 200 boys a week come through that camp. And every week, several boys had to go home. Uh, they couldn't handle it. it was, they called homesickness, which is a, a type of separation anxiety. Now, uh, how many people have a dog? A dog? Okay, I have three cats. Used to have a dog. The dog's gone now. But that dog had separation anxiety. He wanted to be with us all the time. And when he saw, he saw the signs of us leaving, he would start to get worked up. He would get worked up. Uh, even my cats... In our home, we have taken in three strays, uh, not all at one time. They showed up different times in our life, and uh, uh, we felt sorry for them, so we took them in. We live out in a rural community near a farm, and people abandon their cats. They drop them off. They end up on my doorstep, and uh, I can't, I see them starving, and I, before you know it, uh, the vet has a nice big bill for me for taking care of these cats. He likes us. You know, I, somebody says, probably the vet dropping them off. You know, I don't know. But separation anxiety, we all, we know what it is. We've seen it or we've experienced it. Some of us have, have gone through that. But what about separation anxiety from God? From God, a separation that the person can feel from God. I'll read the memoirs of a person, and I'll tell you who it is in a minute. And it shocked me when I heard this, but this was written in, her memoirs, um, and composed into a book. But she writes, she says, where is my faith? Even deep down, right in there, is nothing but emptiness and darkness. My God, how painful is this unknown pain. It pains me without ceasing. I have no faith. I dare not utter the words and thoughts that crowd into my heart and make me suffer untold agony. So many unanswered questions live within me. I'm afraid to uncover them because of the blasphemy. Notice that she says, if there be God, please forgive me. Signed, Mother Teresa. I was shocked when I came to realize that she spent 50 years of her life feeling that she was rejected by God. Yet she was an incredible woman. Mother Teresa was a stereotypical nun, self-effacing, self-sacrificing, hardworking, and always in prayer. She seemed to embody saint-like qualities. She held the hands of lepers as they died. She kissed the cheeks of faces sunken in starvation. And she ministered to the poorest of the poor with her hands, her smile, and her loving attention. The article goes on to say, certainly she had faith at least the size of a mustard seed, or did she? A book released earlier this year says, yes and no. The book is called, Come Be My Light, the private writings of Mother Teresa. And we learned that, our, uh, that Mother Teresa's prayer, prayers grew arid and empty and she felt abandoned by God that even as she promised Jesus' love to others, she herself no longer felt it. 
Now, I know that Mother Teresa does not understand some of the truth of Scripture like we do, but yet she did live uh, the Sermon on the Mount, did she not? She was a very humble, giving, serving person. But turn with me to Matthew 7. You know, God has standards, and he has things that he expects of us, and I can't know. I would certainly never deign to judge a person like Mother Teresa. I doubt I will ever measure up to her self-sacrifice in my lifetime. I don't think there's enough life left in me to measure up to what she accomplished in those areas, but what does Jesus say in Matthew 7, verse 21? He says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils? And I want you to consider that now. Here's an individual whose religious walk, whose religious life was such that they were actually able in the name of Jesus Christ to cast out demons. And here's what he says about them. In my name and done many wonderful works, which clearly describes the work of the person we know, his mother Teresa. Then Jesus says, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. And she in her writings says so. That for 50 years, she had a dearth, a drought of her relationship with the person that she understood to be Jesus Christ. I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now, was Mother Teresa working iniquity? You say, well, no, she wasn't. Well, yes, she was. In some ways, she was. Unknowingly, perhaps. I think certainly unknowingly. Because she wasn't living according to the scriptures in terms of the Sabbath and the Holy Days on that part. Now, I want to stop there and say the Sabbath and the Holy Days don't save us, do they? Because if they did, the Jews, remember, rejected Christ. So, but they kept the Sabbath and the Holy Days. It's not the Sabbath and the Holy Days that saves us. It is indeed our Savior who saves us. But here you have a person who arguably, in all of Christendom, would stand way at the top in terms of setting an example of living up to the Sermon on the Mount. Yet she, by her own words, that were secret until she was gone, says that she was desperately um, despondent because she felt she had no relationship with the one that she was claiming to represent. Interesting, isn't it? Separation anxiety. Separation Rejection of any kind is difficult, isn't it? Uh, how many have ever asked somebody out on a date and got told no? You know? You know? Been rejected by a group of friends. Been fired. I've been fired. People have been fired. That's a, that's a horrible thing to go through when it happens. Sometimes it's for cause, with, sometimes without cause. But even if it's without cause, which was in my case, I should say, it still, it still feels bad. Because you build up a relationship with the people you're working with and all of a sudden the company decides, well, we don't need you anymore. And that relationship just, you say you're going to stay in touch, but you never do. The relationship comes to an end and it hurts. It hurts bad. Rejection. Frankly, brethren, that is the whole story of the Bible. Rejection. The whole story of the Bible begins with separation from God and ends with a reuniting with God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Today is just going to be a summary of what we all know. No mysterious new truths in this sermon. It's going to be a summary of what we all know. Remember how it started. You had Adam and Eve in the garden, took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were told not to do. And the serpent was beguiling them. God said to the serpent, on your belly you'll go, dust you'll eat all the days of your life. And I think I shared with you this understanding here before in a sermon that snakes don't eat dust, that it's a symbol, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor. We are that dust. We're the dust of the ground. And God said to the snake, to the serpent, to the, to the enemy, you work through the dust of the ground and I'm going to work through the dust of the ground and I'm going to win. 
And the great controversy, the great battle began. But what did God do? He took care of them. He took them out of the garden. He said, you cannot come back. There was the, this was the first separation that mankind experienced. And it was severe. Now, cherubim are always present at the throne of God. So this was the very highest part of the authority of God Almighty. And he said, you are gone out of here and you can't come back. So the separation began right there in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? So, moving quickly through history, as we're going to have to do to get through Genesis all the way to Revelation, <laughs> um, you have the, we, we come to a place where God has a special covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. And we know about that. We understand that from sermons and our own Bible study. And we have King David, and then we have King Solomon, who builds this amazing temple. And during the dedication of that temple, we see evidence of God's Shekinah glory in that temple, his very presence, the smoke and the clouds fill the temple. It happened when the musicians were playing, and then it happens a second time when Solomon is up on the platform making the prayer of dedication. And that's in 2 Chronicles 6. If you want to go there, I'm not going to turn to all these scriptures today. But Solomon asks in his dedication, he said, will the, will God, will the very God dwell with men? Well, he, would, he did it one time, teaching them personally in that garden. But now there was this separation that had occurred. Well, as time went on, that Levitical priesthood, who were responsible for the care of the temple and to keep it, began to exhibit abominable behavior, and God left that temple. I'm pretty sure I gave a sermon about that here too. This is just a refreshing, a refresher of the, that, that fact, that God left that temple. And he left the temple, and he left Israel. And the separation moved forward. The separation got worse. And we actually can... We do, I do want to turn to one of those scriptures. Let's go find it here in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 11 and 23. And you can start the story of God leaving the temple back in Ezekiel chapter 8 and read through there. But it culminates in Ezekiel chapter 11 in verse 23. And it says, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon the mountain which was on the east side of the city. Now before that, the glory of the Lord was actually in that temple. It was right there in that temple, in the Holy of Holies. He was right there. But he looked around and he saw what the Levitical priesthood was doing. Abominable behavior. He describes it in there. He says great abominations, horrible abominations. That was the abomination that made the temple desolate, by the way. The people were, it was the people responsible for the temple who had abominated it. And he left. Then what happened next? Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem, and Babylon took Israel captive. And Nebuchadnezzar took the, the instruments of the temple, took them to his palace. Now later, continuing to move through history, the, the temple was restored again. Then in 167 B.C., the same thing happened. The same thing happened. The people again who were responsible to take care of that place, abominated that temple again, and Antiochus Epiphanes attacks Jerusalem. And because of the abomination of the priesthood, Antiochus desecrates that temple, kills and murders and slaughters and tortures many of the Israelites, and takes swine flesh and puts it on the altar in that temple, that restored temple. And it wasn't over yet, was it? Then much later, now we're talking about just Shortly after the time of Christ, this was the thing he was warning the disciples about, the temple, because that hadn't happened yet when Jesus was still walking the earth. It was going to come after that, about 40 years after that. The temple's restored one final time and stands in the time of Jesus Christ. But he finds there that the priests, again, those charged with the responsibility to care for that temple, their behavior was also abominable. And he says to them, after he overturns those tables and chases the animals out of the temple, he said they had made his house of prayer a den of thieves. So God wasn't 
involved in that temple anymore. It was gone. The separation just continued to fester and worsen for mankind from the very beginning even up to this time. So this time, this third and final time, now Titus of Rome marches on Jerusalem and he not only sacks the temple, he destroys it. He tears it down. And the only thing that remains of that temple today, interestingly enough, and that's a whole other sermon, is the foundation of that temple still there and we call it the Wailing Wall. But as God's plan for mankind moved forward, it called for the word, the Logos, to actually participate in what it means to be a man, a human being. So Christ appears as the Messiah and the Savior and walks among us, feeling the feels and smelling the smells of what it's like to be what he created, a human, a human being. And that's a pretty awesome thing to consider. You know, it, if it, as it were, ladies, if you were sewing, you're doing your sewing, could you become the dress? Well, he did that. Men, if you were building a workbench in your garage, could you become the workbench? He did that. He became what he created. He became a human being. And in that process, he was in all points tempted as we are. We see that in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Now we have this amazing thing happening. Mankind has messed it up to the nth degree. Worsened the separation in every turn, at every turn. Rejected all of the opportunities God had given mankind for a close relationship with him, mankind was always thumbing their nose at God. As a whole now, not individually, but as a whole. Mankind was not doing very well. But now we have this person, this Messiah, this precious one who comes to us, a God being who takes human form, walks among us, and now starts to live as a human being. And he's beginning a process that will bring reconciliation to the separation. But here it says, in Hebrews 14, it says, Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Notice it, it's very important to get this, but was in all points tempted like we are tempted. So what's the most despicable sin you can think of? At one time in his life as he walked on the earth, that temptation came to Jesus Christ. Take all of the Ten Commandments. Start there. Every one of those. How about thou shalt not have any other gods before me? Was Jesus tempted to turn his back on the Father? Apparently so. But he didn't. He never did. He never did. And you notice the night before he's crucified, he said, please take this cup away from me. And the, father's, the father did not do that. He had to go through with the crucifixion. So we saw something occurring there the night before, even though, and I like to put it this way, he accepted the decision of the father not to take that cup away, which shows that the love between the two of them transcended the need to agree perfectly on everything. Isn't that what a marriage is? Isn't that what a friendship is? Isn't that what getting along is? where you have respect or love that transcends the need to agree on every little thing. Otherwise, every flower in the field would be yellow or blue or whatever color the father wanted it to be. There would only be one species of bird. There would be only one color of cow. Maybe there'd only be one color. You know, who knows? But. They had the kind of love and respect for one another and they set it as an example for all of us that transcends the need for perfect agreement, didn't they? But Jesus, here he is. He's the one charged with the responsibility of reconciling the separation anxiety that started in the garden. And he had to live for 33 and a half years without ever giving into a temptation. I dare say 
I couldn't get through a day without giving <laughs> through a temptation. He lived for 33 and a half years without giving in to any temptation. And you know what? i got to be honest. I've not been tempted in every way. You know, you put a plate of brownies in front of me, I'm going to have a problem. You know. <laughs> and other things. I won't go into the other things. But I, I haven't been tempted in every way. I, I dare say you probably haven't been either. But he was tempted in everything. Everything. Every possible way. That's what it says, right? That's what it says. Tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So here he is. But if Christ was one of us, a human being, part of his creation. And remember, we were thrown out of the garden, banished from the garden. Now he's one of us. It says that if we don't recognize that, it's the spirit of the Antichrist. We have to recognize that he was flesh and bone, just like we are. And he hurt just like we do. But if Christ was one of us, did he experience now, question, did he experience that banishment from Eden feeling that we all experience at some point in our life? usually before conversion, sometimes after. And if it gets to the level of what the Mother Teresa experienced, that can be really deep and profound. But did Jesus, there's a question, we're going to ask that, we're going to answer it. Did Jesus experience that separation anxiety? Well, interesting question. We know that he experienced a very close relationship with the Father. So let's look at two examples that show us that. The first one, let's look at uh, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, and this is where he resurrects Lazarus back to life. Now, I'm going to read the whole story. We'll save time, but Lazarus dies. Jesus doesn't go right away, uh, and um, eventually he comes, and Lazarus is buried. He's all wrapped up in the burial garment. He's already in the, the cave or the tomb where he was buried, and everybody's crying and weeping, and he's upset because of their lack of faith. But it was all set up by him to happen this way so that he could demonstrate something, an important lesson. And he says something amazing when he resurrects Lazarus. He says at the end there, and he took verse 41 of John 11, he says, And they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And he goes on to say, and I know that you hear me always. Now, if I passed out a survey and asked you to sign it, and the question would say, do you think God always hears your prayers? Do you think God always answers your prayer? But you had to be perfectly honest in answering that. I bet most of us would not write yes. There's times in our Christian life when we drift, when we drift away. And we don't feel that relationship as tightly as we'd like it to be there. And it's a number of reasons sin usually is involved, but sometimes it's a feeling of unworthiness. And brethren, we can never be worthy. It's not our worthiness that makes the relationship worth. It's his. But Jesus said he never felt that. He said, you hear me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it. What did he say? Father, I thank you that you have heard me. That's what he said. He said that for their benefit, because he knew that they hear him. I said it that they may believe that you have sent me. So that's one example right there where we see very clearly that Jesus did not feel that, that, that separation anxiety that we experience. All right, let's uh, look at another example. The night before he was crucified in his prayer, what we call the real Lord's Prayer, in John 17. Jesus is praying with great intensity. In verse 20 of John 17, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which will believe on them through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one. So here's another example in Scripture where Jesus was saying that he and the Father were like that. No space between them. They were tight. There was no separation anxiety. No separation. They didn't experience. Jesus wasn't experiencing what mankind was experiencing. 
but he would. We'll get there. You know, but he felt and experienced rejection. Yeah, absolutely he did. To perhaps a much greater degree than most during the course of his 33 and a half years, he experienced it a lot deeper than we do. But it was different. It wasn't from the Father in the way that we get that separation anxiety because we're not necessarily living the way that we should with the type of zeal that we should. And it's different for everybody. Everybody's life is different. That's why Scripture says, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. But Isaiah chapter 53 speaks of this uh, rejection. Isaiah chapter 53 It says in verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we did as it, he hid, we hid as it were our faces from him. When Jesus went through the cross, and you have to remember who was he? He was the rock star of his day, wasn't he? The feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Happened many times. All the people he healed, people who didn't see could see. People who didn't walk could walk. People who were dying of leprosy were clean. He was healing people from the grave, bringing people back to life. He was the rock star of his day. They knew he was a good man. A good man. A good person. At least they knew he was that. But yet when they put him on the cross, everybody walked away. He was completely rejected with the exception of John and the women were there. Men, the women were there. The Jews still reject him to this day as legitimate Messiah. So did Jesus experience rejection? Yes, he did. You know, God warned us that he would not remain in the presence of sin. Isaiah chapter 59 now. Isaiah chapter 59 in verse 1. And the prophet writes, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Okay, it's pretty plain, isn't it? If you sin, there is a separation. And some of you are thinking, well, he says in Hebrews, he never leaves us nor forsakes us. We'll get there. But here in Hebrews, it's referring to the Father. The Father will not stand in the presence of sin. And that created some things that had to happen in this plan that was being worked out with the Messiah and our Savior and the precious Lamb of God and the things that He had taken upon Himself, the full and complete burden of the responsibility of being our sacrifice. This had to be addressed. This had to be addressed too. The access to the Father went from the banishment in the garden to his departing from the temple back in those days, those three times. Actually, it was once. He never really came back, but there was a relationship in the other two temples because Jesus did refer to that final temple as his father's house, did he not? He wanted it to be a house of prayer. So the access went from banishment in the garden, out of the garden you go, not to ever to come back, Departing from the temple, and that had to be, you know, for the people who really sighed and cried and cared about that temple, who cared about righteousness, who cared about the truth of God, that moment when the Shekinah glory went up into the temple, went up into the mountain left, that had to be an awful, awful moment for the people alive at that time. And then they went into captivity after that, and it got more awful as time went on. For the next 600 years, it continued to get worse. So the departing from the temple, 
up to the time of Christ's death on the cross. And at that time, at the time of his death, now there was this heavy drapery in that temple that was still standing then. They called it a veil. It was a symbol. The veil was the symbol of the separation that I'm talking about today. It was the symbol of that separation. And it, and it, and it hung there. The Father who inspired these words in Isaiah 59, it says he hides, he hides his face from us and will not hear when we're involved in sin. He takes his word very seriously. And that is the truth. I would like to tell you it's not the truth, but that is the truth. The whole Bible explains the story of this separation anxiety and the need for the separation. The father was dead serious that he would not remain in the presence of sin. And that separation from him was part of the penalty for having sinned. It may be the biggest part of the penalty for having sinned. For Israel it was. For the nation of Israel it was. So when our precious Lord took upon himself all of the sin of mankind, and I like to say it this way, and I mean all of the sin of mankind, Never forget that he also took upon himself the penalty of that awful separation. And even with all he had suffered, this final moment of separation caused him anxiety. So yes, Jesus too was going to have separation anxiety the likes of which we can't even understand. Greater than we can't imagine. When with his final breath, he cried out, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's look at that in Matthew chapter 27. In 46, verse 46. And based on the way the scripture is written, one can conclude that he didn't see it coming. That for some reason he didn't see it coming. And I think it may be that way because he spent 33 and a half years having that perfect, positive, powerful relationship with the Father 24-7. And so here he is with a surprise here in Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the rocks But when, as he said, it was finished, and he died, that veil of separation was torn, as we just read, from top to bottom. Normally you would tear something hanging from the bottom up. This was torn from the top down, symbolizing it was torn from above. Symbolizing that this separation was now coming to an end. Now coming to an end. And mankind once again had a new access to the Father. The tide was beginning to turn with the death of Jesus Christ. But we have to do our part. We understand the access. We'll talk about that now. But we have to do our part. Matthew 22, we would all like to appear at that great wedding feast when Christ returns, Matthew 22, but we do have a responsibility in it, don't we? And Jesus is speaking, and he gives a parable of the wedding supper. And it says, and we'll pick it up in Matthew 22, verse 8, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, 
But they which were bidden were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and, in, into, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all as many as they could find, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man which did not have on a wedding garment. Now I want to remind you that it tells us in Revelation that that wedding garment is actually granted to us. Lest you should think by reading this, I'm saying you've got to work, you've got to, you, you, you've got to earn this. No, your obedience earns you nothing. No, that's not right, Mr. Ed. Your obedience does earn you something. Your obedience earns you a relationship with the one who gives you this garment. Without the obedience, you won't have the relationship, and he'll, you'll never get the garment. But the garment itself is a gift. It's grace. It's the grace of God. It's a gift. It's righteousness. A man that which not, had not on a wedding garment, verse 12, and he said to him, Friend, how came thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then said the king unto the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. I don't have time to go through that, but the study of what is that outer darkness, one of the biggest mysteries of Scripture, the outer darkness is the place where the people who are going into the lake of fire are waiting for their final judgment. And they're waiting in that outer darkness before they are destroyed. They're not all destroyed at one time. That outer darkness is the holding pen on the earth where that, where that occurs. And you can study that when you... We'll, we'll, we'll do that in another sermon. We'll talk about that in another sermon at another time. But we have to do our part. Now, is our part, I'm going to be perfect today? Well, okay, that's good. You, you know, you want to set yourself some goals. <laughs> and I always say the best goals you should have is turn to the fruits of the Holy Spirit and say, I want to be those things. And I promise you, if you set the fruits of the Holy Spirit as your life goals, you will be a wonderful person. Patience, long, you know, all gentleness, meekness, goodness, love. If you set those things as your goal, you know, you'll get, you'll get more accolades than Joe Biden. Anyway, I had to say that. <laughs> but we have to do our part. But never, never forget that the actual wedding garment is a gift that's given to us. But you can't receive the gift if you don't have a relationship with the gift giver. And the obedience is, the relation, is what gives you the relationship. Okay. There was now a way back to the Father, wasn't there? A pathway. The veil was torn, now there's a pathway. The Bible talks about a way, walking away. There's a way, a pathway back to the Father. James chapter 4 actually summarizes this in how we live our life and how we do our daily activities, how we think, how we plan, how we do. James right in verse Four, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Actually, there's favorite scriptures that, I've, that we all have. This is one of my favorite scriptures because it says that if I resist, you know, when you feel the onslaught, I, my wife and I say this thing when we get up and a lot, things start going wrong. I say this day has a disagreeable spirit in it. Brethren, that's not too far from the truth because we are surrounded by spirits. Good ones and bad ones. Yeah, angels and demons. We are surrounded by those things. We know that, you know, Satan got right into Peter in the garden in the face of Christ. So we're surrounded by those influences. And so when you say this day has a disagreeable spirit, and maybe that's a time to just stop and say, okay, I recognize that it does. Ah, maybe a little extra prayer wouldn't hurt today. You know, and if it gets really bad, maybe some fasting Submit yourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil. You've got to put up a resistance. You've got to fight. It takes effort to fight a back against those things. And it says, and this is, the, this is the, the great part of that verse, he will flee from you. It's like a command. It's in the Word of God. It is a command. He will flee from you. You can make it go away. You can make it go away. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Isn't that wonderful? But who starts the process? You do. I do. We do. We have to start the process. Providence moves us 
in the direction of a worthy goal. It's a worldly saying, but it's based on Scripture. Providence will move us in the right direction if we have a right direction in mind. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves to God is obedience, isn't it, right? Verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know, when you're trying to overcome something, you know, we all know this, you don't take one giant leap. It's never that way. Well, it's rarely that way. Let's put it that way. Some people can do that. It's rarely that way. Talk to somebody who's been an alcoholic or overcome drugs addiction or any kind of addictions. It's rarely one giant leap. It's a matter of a couple steps forward, a step backward. A couple steps forward, a step backward. As long as the overall pattern is positive, that's what we're looking for. That's what God wants to see. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I think I wrote down the wrong verse, but I think I can find it here. All right, verse 19 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Nevertheless, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from sin. It's a good thought as we prepare and look now toward, what is it? Passover. Here we go again, right? Round the corner to Passover. Okay, depart from sin. But in a great house, there are not, not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from the, these, the sins, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. Brethren, these scriptures in James and here in 2 Timothy show us that that separation is no longer the way it was. It's no longer a separation of abject completeness. There's a pathway, there's a way to go back to the Father. And also we know, and I can't turn to all these scriptures, you know them, it says, the last shall be first. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So you're the last one who joined the church. You're the last one who started to overcome, and maybe the last one baptized. You might be the first one in the kingdom of God. God's the one who judges. Jesus is the one who judges, by the way. Scripture tells us the Father judges no man. The judgment is committed to Jesus. Why is the judgment committed to Jesus? Class? The answer is because he was one of us. And he lived among us. And he experienced everything we experience. He has all the evidence. And more than that, it says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And never means never. I like to put it this way. He's with us during the good, the bad, and the ugly. You're sitting in the presence of Jesus. Why? Because he wants to have, when he stands up there on that throne, on that bench, when you come before him and he's your judge and he's going to make the judgment for your life, However long it was, you can be absolutely certain that Jesus of Nazareth, who walked among us, experienced what you experienced, felt what you felt, and he was with you the whole, every second of your life. So he has all of the evidence to make the right judgment. And he became the perfect judge by what he experienced living among us. Isn't that beautiful when you consider it that way? Again, Hebrews chapter 4, it has greater meaning when you consider those things. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who lived among us and felt everything that he felt, experienced everything that he experienced, and he knows every second of your life. I don't know how he can do it, but he does it. A great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are. God is not an ogre. God is not ruthless. We 
worship a merciful God who did all of these things so that you can be reunited with the Father. That's why he did it. He was our elder brother and our king, and he did it so that you, individually, you, can be reunited with the Father. That's why he did it. That was his purpose. That was their purpose in all of this plan, from the banishment to the reunion that we know about. 1 John chapter 1. First John 1 and verse 9. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all. Yeah, mankind is kind of interesting the way we judge one another. You know, we take certain sins, oh, you, know, you can't be forgiven of that. I'm not, I'm not going to forgive you that thing. You know, that little white lie you told grandma, we can forgive you that. That's no, no big deal. But that other thing you did, we can't forgive that. Well, it's not what the Bible says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you that you sin not. You know, the whole plan is we've got to not sin. Obedience is what gives you the relationship. The relationship is important. You've got to nourish that relationship. The nourishing of that relationship comes from your effort in obedience. So yes, your works do earn you something. They earn that relationship. They keep it solid. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation of our sins, and not of ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby do we know that we know him... If we keep his commandments, you know, the old, when I was a teenager in high school, the evangelical kids in the school, they got these wristbands that said, know the Lord. And they didn't have a clue what that meant. You have to give your heart to the Lord, know the Lord. You have to know, do you know the Lord? And that's how they would talk to you. Do you know the Lord? And they, no, I'm, let me tell you about Jesus. Okay, tell me about Jesus. I was a Catholic boy. I knew more about Jesus than they did. But they were going to tell me about Jesus. They were going to help me know the Lord. You know the Lord by doing what he says to do. That's how you know him. This is the one scripture that is the foundation of what I said earlier, that it is your obedience that gets you a relationship with God. And obedience doesn't save you. It just gives you the relationship. The quality of that obedience will be judged by someone who was tempted in every way you were tempted and saw every minute of your life. The perfect judge. There is no other perfect judge than that. And that's why he, and he alone, is our mediator. The one who's going to put an end to the separation anxiety that humanity has experienced since the Garden of Eden. He is the one. Jesus is the one. The Savior, the mediator, the Messiah, the one who's going to put an end to that separation. His work, not our work, his work is going to put an end to that separation. So since being banished from the garden, seeing God leave the temple, seeing God leave Israel, watching the temple be destroyed three times, and you think about the history of Israel. You know, you can't leave out things that we know in our secular history like Dachau and Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Bergen-Belsen. You can't leave those things out, brethren. They, well, they, did not reje they rejected Jesus Christ. They didn't see him as King of kings and Lord of lords. And I wonder in my heart of hearts, had they done that, would that have happened? I wonder. And I have to say my conclusion is, I doubt it. I doubt that our Jewish brothers, our dear Jewish brothers would have had to experience that horrific fate if they had accepted Jesus instead of rejecting him? I don't know. That's for God to decide. I don't know. But, he w but they had to go through that. Then Christ experiencing the forsaking of the Father. Brethren, that penalty, remember, 
He took that for us. The hardest part, probably. Yes, the physical torture that he endured was really, really rough. But put on top of that, the father turning his back and forsaking. The word forsaken is using. The father forsook, forsook him. And I don't know if you saw The Passion of the Christ. But, you know, it's not a perfectly accurate movie. But at, the at that moment, when the, when the father turns his back, just before the father turns his back on Jesus, the camera goes up into the sky and a giant tear falls down from heaven. What do you think the father was feeling? How hard do you think it was for him to turn his back on his perfect son? They did it for us. The one on the cross did it for us. And the one who was turning his back did it for us too. You know, we think of what Jesus did. Think for a minute about what the father did. Think what the father did. Have you had to watch your children go through difficult moments? Well, Jesus was his son, his one and only son. And he had to do what he had to do, and he had to turn his back on his son. How hard was that? Then the tide was turned. At the moment when he said it is finished and he died, the veil was torn and he said it was finished. We now had a high priest who desires oneness. As he prayed the night before he was crucified, he desires oneness with all of us. He wants us to be one with him and he wants him and us to be one with the Father again. But finally, this plan calls for the very, and I say finally, but thankfully and excitedly and wonderfully, the whole plan, the, the final part of the plan, calls for the very presence of the Father once again among men. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, final scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ that is coming. Then, the conclusion of the matter, brethren, then comes the end. When he, Jesus, how, will have delivered up the kingdom, you know, you've got to go through his return, through the age of the Lord. Some people refer to it as the day of the Lord. The age of the Lord lasts a thousand years. Then there's a, a battle at the end when Satan is released. Those people are all destroyed. The people who remain are righteous people. Then eventually the earth is converted from physical to spiritual with a new heaven and a new earth. And it says, and then... When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy is death. And he turns the glorified, purified, Eden-like perfect earth over to the Father, and the Father comes and dwells with man. No more separation anxiety. So when you think of who we worship, remember these things or what they did for us. It is your part in it is a piece of history of all of that that we talked about way back from the snake in the dust all the way to the time when Jesus turns the kingdom over to the Father and there is no more separation. God be with you till we meet again.